Hi everyone. Um, nice to see you all today. Just trying to see if my webcam works. Sometimes it's been a little bit temperamental. This new one. There we go. Perfect. Okay, I figured it out. There we go. Um, I got a new webcam right when the term's ending. Isn't that exciting? Uh, it's, it's super. I'll talk about that later. Anyway, welcome to week 10. Um, I know we can't celebrate too much because you still have an assignment due this week. I'm really sorry. I know it's a little bit annoying, but at least you had a lot of time with it. And it seems like, um, everyone is slowly like not everyone. It seems like people are starting to get their head around a few more things. I know last week it seemed like everyone was felt like they were really struggling to punch up against the basics. So, um, really <coughs> thrilled to see that and really proud of you. Um, I haven't had a chance to actually, uh, check who the real uh, winners are um, of the competition, but unless people in the chat are lying to me, um, it's Hamish Cox and Jack Lee, Jack, Jack, Jack Lee, is that, I hope no one's lying to me, otherwise I'm going to get really mad, but um, if that's the case, then congratulations for winning the CSC SOC Comp 2521 revision, I don't know what it was, trivia night, something. Um, revision competition or something like that. Um, Hamish first place and Jack second. Great job. Um, someone says uh, Hayden said webcams are overpriced. Correct, except there's a very long winded story where I don't make any money from work. So in return, I ask if I can buy a couple of pieces of technology for free and I bought a cheap webcam. Um, yeah, credits to Ronan Davis and Adam uh, Snoyman, Cameron McGowan and Matthew Richards as well. Um, it's really great to see so many people representing, um, you know, representing uh, 2521. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yes, I don't really have much else to say on that front. Today, we're going to be jumping into uh, exam stuff. Now, we have four hours this week. I don't know if we'll use all of it, like we can basically use it till we run out of time. The priority today is just to talk through the final exam. Um, in particular, to talk through this page. Uh, this page will be updated with some more information that CSE wants me to convey to everyone. Really boring, um, uh, you know, like these are the things you can and can't do, like kind of kind of like legalish, not legalish stuff, you know what I mean? Stuff that you read and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I think there's some upda updated plagiarism clauses. However, I just want to take you through this um, because I know we've been doing, this is the fourth term that some of you might be doing online exams, um, but I think it's still really important to really emphasize some of the key, key elements of what an online exam entails. So the most important thing about <coughs> an online exam is that, um, you need to you need to kind of sim, uh, satisfy some minimum requirements, which are mainly focused on that you need a stable internet connection during the duration of the exam. Okay, this is like something that's really, really, really important. And the reason I say that is because if you obviously have like major internet problems, that is grounds for special consideration. But we can't really give you extra time if your internet goes down for ten minutes. Uh, just because it's a bad connection, if that makes sense. Um, I understand that what's different this term compared to previous other terms is that um, we're currently dealing with stay-at-home orders in Sydney, uh, which makes all of this very complicated because in the past, the solution just used to be to you know, go to a library or go to a friend's house or something like that. What I would say to you, though, is like it's really hard to... Like, it's really hard just to grant consideration if you have a bad internet connection. So you need to do all that's humanly possible for it in terms of like, you know, move your desk to another part of the house or move your laptop there or change things around or tell your family if if you have limited bandwidth that you don't want them to use it during a time. Like there's a lot of, lot of ways you can play with that. Um, and if you're really in a situation where your, your internet works, it's just kind of because of your home Wi-Fi or something, it's not very stable and that stresses you out, you could probably apply for special consideration in advance um, or talk to me in advance and potentially do a SUP uh, in a month or potentially in a few months when like COVID comes back together. This is 
like COVID kind of gets out of our way a little bit and you have some more wiggle room here. Um, the point is that <clears throat> generally unstable internet's your responsibility to try and fix. And if you can't fix it, then just get in touch with me to see what we can do. Now, this is separate from the idea of your internet failing. Okay, this happens sometimes. It usually happens to one student every time. The internet just stops working. Maybe your mobile provider goes out. Maybe your modem stops getting a connection. In these situations, it's nearly always something that's documented with your ISP. Um, last time, I think there was a construction site that knocked a cable and someone's internet went down. Um, uh, th before that, there was... Uh, um, you know, someone's ISP collapsed. In all of these cases, there's usually a way to get some documentation. So for instance, if your actual internet goes down and it's not your fault, you can usually just email Telstra or whoever you're with and say, hey, I need, I need, I need, can you please confirm the internet went down in this area today? And they'll respond with like, yes, it went down in this area. And you can screenshot that. And then that is your special consideration, basically. That's what gets you the SUP. So please keep that in mind. If during the exam you run into any of these issues with your internet, like major ones, like, you know, that um, your ISP has gone down or something, or you fall ill during the exam, you also need to email CS2521 because UNSW still follows the sit to fit, sit to fit, fit to sit policy, which says that it, by starting the exam, you're acknowledging that you are well enough to start the exam. So the second you start the exam, you basically can't um, claim a pre-existing issue um, as special consideration. So if, you were like, if you're like sick two days before the exam and you wake up on the exam day and you're better but you're really tired and you haven't done enough work, you can't, you can't really start the exam and then say, oh, sorry, I was sick, I need special consideration. Special consideration during an exam is only for things that come up during an exam. Uh, health issues that appear during the exam. If you're unwell that morning um, and you know about it, you need to not sit the exam and do a SUP. Um, if there are any questions about that, now's the time to ask. In terms of the... Okay, yeah, so Matthew Johnston says, if my internet is knocked down during the exam, should I stop or should I try and use my phone's hotspot at a slower speed? I mean, firstly, this exam I don't think is going to have much of a relevance, like your internet speed's not going to be very relevant for this kind of exam, generally speaking. Like, um, you know, sure, if you're trying to use VLAB VS code and stuff, then I guess it would be a little bit laggy, but um, it's kind of up to you. If your internet's knocked down for reasons outside of your control, you need to let us know immediately. Whether, well, okay, let me, let me phrase it. If your internet goes down out of your control during the exam, then you need to make a decision there as to whether an alternative like a hotspot is fine for you or whether you want to call the exam there, email me and go sit us up. That's totally up to you. Um, you know, that's, that's 100% up to you. Um, yeah, the thing you can't do, and like, by God, don't, don't put me in this position because it happens every time and it makes me want to just like gouge my eye out, honestly, is like, don't, Mainly because I feel bad because, anyway, you'll, you'll understand. I should have ended with that. Um, don't finish the exam and then email me later telling me there was a problem. I can't help you then is the, is the thing. Like, I had this happen last term. I, I, I crap you not, a student in a different course, they, the exam finished. Eight hours later at one in the morning, they emailed me and they said, oh, I forgot to submit to give. And I was like, why didn't you, why didn't you tell me what like, just, uh, like the end of the exam? Like, like, no, it actually said, I forgot to submit to give at the end of the exam. And I was like, why didn't you submit it? Give it. Why didn't you email me then? And he was like, I had a nap. And I was like, what do you mean you had a nap? What do you mean you had a, like a, like a, like a seven hour nap? Like when, like I get anxious because I can't, like, I can't do anything in these scenarios. Right. Like, and I feel bad. Like I'm not like, angry at someone. I'm just like you've created a situation here where I can't help you because I believe you, but it doesn't matter because you could be lying. And while you could be lying, we like, you get the point, right? So it's like, it's like just, you know, if something goes wrong, just email me, me, me and Kevin, Kevin will be there too. But like, just email me. Like if something goes wrong, if, 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 you know, if your computer crashes at 3.55 PM 
and the well this exam finishes at midday if, you, if your computer crashes at 11:55 email me right then and there you know be like the computer's just crashed and we'll be like i don't know what we'll say we'll be like we'll either, we'll, we'll look at your last submission you know maybe you maybe you, like we'll figure it out but the point is you need to communicate because as long as you're communicating we we will do the best we can to help you once once you don't kind of follow the general communication expectations everything's gone okay so the exam time date and duration the exam's three hours um sorry Jer jeremy sent an email from the crash computer straight away you you all have phones you can post on ed like i'm um, you, you could figure it out pretty quickly i'm sure you all have a gmail on your phone you know my name hayden.smith at unsw there's tons of avenues for you there so the exam duration is three hours from 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. on Thursday, the 19th of August. Now, I don't like morning exams either because I have to get up too, and I don't like waking up that early. Um, but it's what time it's at. I'm sorry. Now, this this is mainly a sorry to people that live in Australia, or I guess you know this particular latitude because <clears throat> we will continue just like we have in the past to accommodate students who are in different parts of the world like for instance uh, Asia India well I mean Indo-Asia I should say um, as well as Europe and the US US is probably fine US will just say sit the exam because I don't know what time it is in I mean like what's New York City time at 12 p.m. is gonna be yeah it's like a 7 to 10 p.m. exam I mean obviously if that doesn't that's late-ish, but, you know, I know most of you, if some of you are in New York at the moment or LA or something, you'd probably be like, yeah, it's okay. Evening exams don't sound terrible. Um, but if if you are one of those people and some of them have, have come forward already, that's basically international students who don't fall on this... Is it longitude? I don't know. I, I think so. Um, you don't fall in this part of the time zone. Uh, then email me and we can adjust your start time slightly. Um, email CS2521 and I'll adjust your start time. If you have ELS requirements, um, like if, if you're someone who has some equitable learning and... Equitable learning? Oh my god. Sorry, I want to get this right. Everyone should know about this if you don't. Equitable learning services. Um, this is a great group at UNSW, but basically if, if you think you're dealing with some ongoing... Um, conditions there's a very broad range of these things then they can help you out and create some leniency within courses it has to be like an ongoing condition though special consideration is for sudden unexpected issues illness death in a family uh breaking some bones uh you know severe onset anxiety out of nowhere stuff like this uh, equitable learning services i i just wanted to mention this because someone mentioned earlier that they didn't know about it and i was like oh that's a shame um you can go talk to these people if you feel like you have kind of chronic issues you know maybe you have maybe you have really um poor visibility even with like um the equipment you have uh you could have some physical disabilities that prevent you from typing properly i mean most people like this already know it but i'm, I'm more flagging it for people who don't know about it and you know maybe in the future um can potentially get some help from the uni but anyone who's in this bucket uh you you get an email from me about a week before the exam confirming the details of your timing which you should already know because they're written in the rules but um i'll, I'll confirm those via email for you so that um you're 100 apply uh you're 100 sure what's happening um blake says do we still have time to apply for this i guess so i'd probably say so um so feel free to. Everyone should feel comfortable to. Uh, just my only comment is, you know, most things like this require some kind of medical backing or, or you know, some clear evidence, basically. So, you know, if... <clears throat> if you, for instance, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there are people who have very acute forms of ADHD who get given extra time in exams because it's hard to focus or, or something along these lines. Um, but like you don't just go and say I have this issue they're going to be like can you show us your the, you know your psych appointments your doctor's appointments med like just all of that kind of stuff so um, it, it's not just like a free ride it's there to make education more equitable for people who un unambiguously does you know need it um, cool 
Uh, moving on, one question I skipped over before was, can you please make the exam easy as the assignments were hard? Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question because easy and hard are just words. Um, you know, I could say that and it would mean something different to all of you. Um, we need the exam to test what you know. And our objective is not to make you miserable for the sake of it. That's it. We like another way to phrase it is like we we have a desire to make you all as comfortable and as happy as we can while working within the constraints of the realities of having to assess what you know in the time we have. So um this is the first two five two one exam I, I am dealing with, so I, I don't have a lot of great background on it, but I'd probably say that I doubt this exam, or like a normal mid-tier student would call unnecessarily hard. And I doubt anyone would call it um, too easy, be my guess. Um, yeah, it should be okay. You know, people look at these, we get tutors to practice these exams and all of this stuff. Um, speaking of the exam, in terms of exam structure, <coughs> We have, uh, the decision Kevin and I came to was that the exam is going to be two sections. One is short answer and extended answer questions. Basically, you typing words um, as answers. Um, the other 70% is going to be programming questions, which are basically similar to lab exercises. So, um, you know... The way, the way I guess I want you to think about it is like, you know, th there's two things that we want you to come away from in this course. The first one is being able to um, program in C and actually get things done, right? The second thing is we want you to be able to reason and justify and think about things. So think about like lab nine with the sort, the sort detective stuff. It's like, that stuff is fun because, like, um, uh, that stuff's fun because it's like you actually get to reason with things. We're not testing your coding ability. We're kind of testing your ability to understand concepts and, um, and like, rationalize things. So, um, yeah, that, that stuff is, that stuff what the short answer's for. Why don't we have more, why don't we have all programming? Well, it's because we think we need you to be better than programmers. We think we need you to be able to, you know, explain and justify your thoughts. Um, why don't we have all short answers, which that's a good argument, you know, like understanding is more important than raw coding ability. The answer is because it's not feasible in terms of the timeframes UNSW expects us to mark things in that we can actually get enough tutors marking all hand marked. Um, Assignments, because the programming questions are going to be auto-marked. Um, uh, Wit2024 says, will we have to code from scratch or will it be like the labs where we get skeleton code? So, a mix of both, it, it depends on the types of questions we ask, but what I'd say is, like, if you have to write something from scratch, it would be a relatively uh, simple, um, simple thing to do. But in reality, because of the nature of this course, I imagine that there'd be quite a few questions. Well, the types of questions you get would be ones where we give you like a starting point. So a good example would be, you know, if we asked you to implement an adjacency list or something, um, we'd probably give you the linked list structure already, right? Um, whereas if we, uh, you know, if we, if we didn't give you that, then... Um, it'd be too hard, right? Like, it'd be too hard to build an entire adjacency list in the timeframes we're talking about with this exam. So, you're more likely to see questions where you kind of have some skeleton code or you're just trying to complete something, um, etc. So, just running through some of the other questions here. Um, Jeremy says, will I be able to sit the exam through VS Code just like I've been doing and submitting my labs? Yes. Um, and... Basically, um, it's like a lab or assignment. You, you'll, you'll see there'll be a page linked on WebCMS3. Um, you 
will have access to CSE systems either via VLAB or via VS Code SSH or locally and when you submit your exam we're going to expect you to do it via Give just like you do your labs and assignments. So we, we work really hard to try and give you a very similar experience because we don't want the exam to be about you trying to figure out your interactions with the environment. We want it to be, you know, you answering questions, essentially. Um, and that ties into D Aurora's question about, are you allowed to use debuggers uh, during the exam? And the answer is uh, yes, you can use anything you currently use in the course. So no, you know, um, you can use debuggers, you can use gedit, VS Code. Um, other questions are, is there any reading time for uh, the exam? Uh, no, there's no way to enforce that. It's as simple as that. There's a lot of things online, like what even is reading time? Hey everyone, please don't start. Pretty please, I beg of you. Like that's not tenable, so um, there is no reading time for the exam. Um, because it's not enforceable. Um, just looking through some of the other questions. Uh, there was a comment about labs take me five hours to do one question. To be honest with you, the labs in this course are actually pretty large questions. Um, you know, like when we go to lab three, for instance, they are pretty beefy sometimes. Like this whole lab is like task one, task two, task... This one's like okay-ish, but... Um, I would def your, your exam is probably going to, um, it's, it's not going to be like 10 questions of massive size or anything like that, you know, uh, we, we would expect a standard student to, to feel like they can, you know, get a good grip on the exam. Um, so I'm going to come back to what types of questions you're going to get soon. Um, but I'm just going to keep answering some tangential questions for the moment. Uh, Kustab says it needs, it says it needs to be done in VLAB or CSE. Does VS Code plus SSH count as VLAB? Yes, it does. Um, absolutely, it does. Now, some other questions I've been getting are about auto testing. Will there be auto testing available? Will all the test cases be given through, uh, to us through auto tests? Um, and will there be any testing provided because testing can take a long time? So the general philosophy that most courses um, would follow in an exam is that you have to do your own testing. Now this makes a lot of, now let me be clear. This is different from saying we're gonna mark you on your testing. That's a different thing. Um, but this makes sense because, you know, if you write sloppy code, you'll have to test it more. If you write better code, you have to test it less. We leave we leave the the circumstances in your boat. We're not going to be marking any tests for the exam. You could write no exam. You could write no tests in this exam. Um, I probably wouldn't write many if I was a student. That's just my behavior, and I'm not in condoning that. Um, but it's kind of like if you want to test it, you can test it. What we what we do provide though or what we will provide, I should say, is a really basic capability um, to essentially run a really minimal dry run on your programming questions. Because a common area we struggle with exams is when students submit questions that don't even compile or they're missing such a fundamental flaw that, um, uh, you know, like, it just doesn't even work. So, like, the the short answer here is that we will be providing you with, um, like, a, a single simple test case and as part of Give submissions, we will try and compile your code so that when you submit your work, we will be able to run a simple, really simple test on it and compile it so that you know your stuff's not totally cooked. Because that's the worst thing that um, you could do in an exam, right, is, like, get something there but then like just have it not work because of something really small so we give these like really simple um really simple auto tests but it's kind of like it's a sandy check it's not it's not there to give you confidence that you got it all right it's there to give you confidence that it's not broken does that make sense um yeah um I don't know. I'm, I'm going to add some notes to this. 
I don't think we said anything about style. Um, so style, I think it's unethical to, I think it's unethical to mark style in a final exam. Um, that's my take. Uh, the reason for that is because a final exam is testing your ability to, to work and think under pressure. I have my views on that. I won't go into it too much, but I, there's no Venn diagram overlap where you can ask someone to work under pressure every exam's like that, and ask them to write nice code. Do you know what I mean? Like, nowhere have I ever seen in reality someone's been like, oh, we need you to get this done quickly, but also it needs to be really clean. It just doesn't happen, right? So it's like, there's no, there's no way we'd ever look at your style or care about your style. Um, it just has to be, com it has to be C code, that's it. Like, so we don't care about your style. Um, So some other questions that are coming up here are kind of questions around the composition of um, the short answers and the programming questions. What I would say for that is I don't want to overprescribe that so much right now because when we release the sample exam later this week, um, I think that'll answer the question for you. But the, the short story I'll tell you now is that you're probably likely to see, you know, um, you know, five, five, six, or seven short answer things where your answer is like a sentence or two, like a sentence. Um, you probably see some longer ones that, you know, might ask you to really justify something potentially. Uh, like, you know, here's a bunch of data. Tell us what type of, t tell us what type of data structure makes sense and why. Like, like, you know, um, this is a new format for us a little bit too. So, because uh, in previous years they've done multiple choice, but I don't like multiple choice because I think it's too easy to plagiarize. Um, it's too easy to copy. So uh, there'll be newish questions, but they're basically just going to be things like, like I think, like a quiz is another. Like while the quizzes are obviously multiple choice, the thing about the quizzes are, um, you know, this kind of question here: which vertices are reachable from vertex three, the director graph? Imagine that we give you this question, except there's no multiple choice answers. You know, which of the following would require both weighted graphs? I mean, that one's probably hard to be. This one was that fun, controversial question. Um, something like this could be a an extended answer. That's like, um, this is the circumstance. What data structure would you use, and why? Like the one I just mentioned before. So <clears throat> that's the kind of nature of those, but you'll probably get your head around that more when we look at the sample, when we can get the sample exam out to you this week. Um, it's all open book exam. The only requirement is that you can't talk to people. And I think that's written in the, in the exam thing here. Um, it's all written here. So <clears throat> uh, Vincent says, how much the exam should we expect to finish? I love this question. Um, it's like me asking you how far can the average student run. I have a general idea, but like the an the answer depends a little bit on like what your own intellects are. Um, the The way I have to answer this. Okay, so let, let me take a step back from all this kind of stuff because this this topic riles me up a lot. But let let me let me let me explain. Some courses are really hard to create finishable exams because the, the content is so broad um, that the kinds of questions are quite simple in nature. Um, and therefore, ans if, you've, if you've found the answer to the question, it's very unlikely you get it wrong. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things that are easy to answer but hard to get right. You know, so there's courses where like the act of answering it is getting it right. And I'll give you a good example. A good example is in Comp 6080, the other course I run, where we say to a, a, a student, go make a gray box this big with this border. Once they do that, they, they pretty much know they have the mark. Like the act of doing it to an extent or solving the problem, like you know if you've got it right. Because if the, you haven't finished it until it's done. You can't, like, you can't think you finished it and not have. Because it just doesn't, you know it's wrong. You can see it. Um, those courses are really hard to do exams for because the only, one of the, like, not the only thing, but a lever you have is to say that, okay, well, what's the difference between a good student and a bad student? A good student will be able to make all those boxes and they'll solve those problems and they'll read through the documentation quicker. 
um, easy. So therefore, we can make an exam for, you know, the top 25% of students should comfortably finish and the rest of them will kind of finish to, they'll get to progressive different parts of it. And then we just kind of make sure the marks all scale sometimes if we need to, right? That's, that's a challenging thing I have to deal with, but not in this course, because one of the benefits of 2521 is that this course, we don't teach you a language. We literally just teach you complicated concepts, um, like implement a Dijkstra's algorithm. You could think you've gotten that right. Um, you could, you could write it and you could be like, oh, it seems right, but you could get it way wrong, way, way wrong. Um, and that's really great because for, for an exam like Comp 2521, we have a lot of capacity to make it finishable, but you could still get a lot of it wrong. You could still get a pretty low mark because you've just done it wrong. Um, so the finishing thing is a little bit of a misnomer sometimes because, um, you know, like, no, no one cares if they finish and they get it all wrong, you know? Um, so, I think it's a bit of a vanity metric sometimes, but the short answer is that for Comp 2521, it is easier, I would say it's going to be easier to finish than a lot of other exams, but it's, it's not going to be easy to get everything right. And that differs in different courses. Like, someone made an allusion to Comp 1511 was, like, impossible to finish. <clears throat> I'm not involved with that course, but I can imagine that that's more likely than this course because... You know, you've had to learn a language. You can only ask so many hard questions. Because um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, I'll give you a bit of a, um, I'll give you a bit of an example here. One of the problems, gen okay, let me let me explain the problem. So the problem is that the best kind of question is one that's very fin very easily finishable and very hard to get right. And that could be a simple, uh, that, like imagine if we just threw you like an assignment two style question in the exam. Here's a graph, calculate the betweenness centrality. Here's all the background on it. Input, output, get it done. You know, um, that's when you have this one giant question. Or think of like assignment one. The problem with asking these types of questions in the exam is that it's often very hard to give out partial marks because in an exam, the kind of very nature of these questions, given that you have to auto mark them, means that if you ask a really big complicated question, then you're going to divide people into a spectrum of those that finished it and did average to good and those that did nothing. And you basically had a huge number of people that failed the exam and then you have to hand mark everything and it costs thousands of dollars and takes weeks and weeks. Um, so the solution then is that you ask a series of smaller questions, you know, maybe the different sizes, maybe a couple of easy ones, a couple of harder ones, and then maybe like a really, like really big scary one at the end or something. That's not how you, how do you do grumpy eyes? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do like a bit, you know, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and this works well because you give students the ability to kind of try some and fail some, you know what I mean? Like the last thing you want is an exam with one question in it where if you don't, if you just don't get it, you're effed. So it's good to kind of have this distribution of things. The only problem is when you make questions smaller, they're easier to plagiarize. So they can't be too small because otherwise people can copy and paste and it's reasonable to assume they wrote the same code. Also, as questions get smaller, they get easier to make sure that they work fine. Like if we just asked you a question that was like, you know, take in an array of characters and capitalize them or turn them into a capitalized string or remove all of the, um, you know, all of the vowels or something. It's like, if you finish that, you kind of know you got it right most of the time, you know? So anyway, I'm, I'm not trying to, I know I'm, I'm not really giving you a clear answer here to much. I'm more just trying to explain that these are the kinds of parameters that you work with when it comes to exam design. But thankfully, 2521, I think, is a really easy course to write exams for. So I'm not worried because I think we'll get a good mix of, you know, you'll have enough questions to feel like you have choices. Um, <clears throat> or at least, like, if you don't get a question you or a part of a question, you'll still feel like you have access to the marks. Um, but I think because we'll be able to make questions sufficiently hard, like, as in, you know, it, it means that, like, you'll have a good chance to finish it um, without nearly everyone getting 100%, right? Um, other questions. Are short answer questions only written or can we attach paint diagrams? They're only going to be written and we're only going to ask you to do things that would make sense written. Uh, 
I'm scrolling back up. Will our files still be submitted even if they don't compile or pass the auto test? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how will programming exercises be chosen? Will we have some random topics or... I said that one already. You have It'll be a series of... Um, there's probably going to be, like, it's hard to say because I, I, you're like, how many questions? It's like, I don't know, we might, we might be writing a big question that has five parts to it. And each of those parts are es essentially their own questions. But if you really want a number for some reason, I'd probably say that there'll be, you know, maybe four to nine discrete parts that you could kind of do in isolation of each other. Um, but we're still writing the exam, so, you know, that depends on the type of exam. But, I mean, that's just, that's an arbitrary number. It's like asking me what the, the price of a stock is. It's like, it's just a number. It's how many you, you know, I don't know, it probably doesn't make any sense. But, um, what kind of difficulty should we expect for the programming questions? Stage three of assignment two, um... I would say there'll be something slightly slightly easier than your assignment questions and slightly easier than the labs. Because again, my desire is to always ask as many questions as I can without them being too easy. Because different questions give you less stress, they give you more chances, but they need to be not too easy. Um, and I think some of the lab exercises and stuff might be a little bit, might be a little bit too big. It depends on the ones. like. Um, again, we're going to release a sample thing, so I don't want to speculate too hard because, you know, like some of these labs are pretty large, um, but also they're only large in the sense that there's a lot to understand. Um, so, I think it's a massive thing. Um, okay, some other questions here. How do we prepare for the theory component the best in the exam? Um, quizzes, I'd say. Quizzes are probably a way to go. I think quizzes give you, like we'll again release some sample stuff, but quizzes will give you a good sense of like the kinds of theory questions we have, plus the sample stuff we release. I'm just reading more. Um, there was a question somewhere about what happens what happens if my um, what happens if my thing doesn't work you said it's auto marked Hayden so what happens if I submit it and it fails the auto marks and I get zero you know um, that's a complicated question I'll give you the best answer I have it is not feasible for us to manually check every one of your exam answers. It's just a reality. The reason I like to ask as many questions as we feasibly can is because it's very unlikely that a student has weird compilation errors that they didn't realize at the time in all these questions. So if you have, say, five questions in an exam and you one of your questions fails to compile, with 500 students and a dozen questions each, we're talking about thousands of questions that need to be marked and wrapped up in six days. The reality is if you make like a mistake in like one question and it tanks everything, you just made a mistake. And you just got to, you know, like, you just got to go, oh, damn, okay, I made a mistake. Should have been more careful about that. I know it was a tiny thing, but that's life, you know? Like, you make mistakes sometimes, you move on. Um... There are two scenarios, though, I want to be stressed this, two scenarios where we actually do manually mark things. One of those is when you, pr you got a really low mark on the programming part of the exam, like 5 out of 100 or 10 out of 100. If you were to email us and say, you know, um, I, I got ridiculously low on that part, and I mean low, 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 right, really low, then we would, they, we would manually mark it we'd look at it and think like, let's just double check that there wasn't something tiny here. And when I say manually mark, I don't mean that we look at your solution and we go, oh, they seem to get it. Um, 
and then we give you some marks. I mean, we look at it and we say, is there one tiny thing that screwed this up? Did they leave a semicolon somewhere at the end that comp didn't compile everything, right? Um, but that's not, that's not really manually marking it. That's more like spending the time to make sure it compiles successfully. <coughs> the one scenario that we do manually mark things, this one's important, is if it's going to be the difference between you passing and failing the course. Okay, so like, if if you know if you if you had an error in your code, and because of that you got a seventy four in the course, and if you didn't make that mistake, you would have gotten a seventy six. It's like that's part of life. You know, it like you make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. Things cost you. You know, you you park in a wrong spot. You get a t like you just. It's just you made a mistake. It has a penalty in life, and you you get on with it. The one area that we don't like to take that approach in is, again, either when your exam is, like, tanked somehow. That doesn't really happen, though. Or, more importantly, if you're about to fail the course. Because if a student is about to fail the course, which is the difference between another $1,000, which is the difference between um, changing up your program, then we, we usually spend the effort to go through the exam and see if, see if we can be lenient. Now, I just want to be clear here that, you know, there are times when we do go through it and we just say the student d didn't understand enough. Like, they just didn't understand enough. And there are times we do go through it and they say, oh, wow, they actually did a lot here. It was all really close, but they just missed the mark and they already got a 48, so we can probably tweak that up a bit. Um, that's pretty much the only scenario where there's real time spent manually marking. Beyond that, we just try and design the auto marker smart. We try and do the question distribution smart. We try and... Um, give you the little dry run thing that Sanity checks it for you so that you don't really have any um, doubts. Uh, yeah, so the question of are we able to flag questions that we think we got close to the answer but didn't run it for it to be marked manually? N no, because it's just not a scalable solution, sadly. Like, it's not a, that's, not, that's not my opinion. That's not my educational opinion. It's just... Um, Everyone would mark it as, please check this, um, just in case. And then we'd have thousands of things to do. So, um, but again, like, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's normal. Like, that's the thing I, I think I, get, I don't get is like, if we asked you a hundred questions and like, you know this intuitively, Kind of getting there for a small question is not getting there. Kind of getting there for a big question feels crappy. You know, like feeling like there was this massive question that you got 90% of the way there on and you didn't. That feels crappy. But that's, again, you just kind of have to trust us that we know how to write exams and that, you know, you're not going to get like 90% of the way there on a question that has a massive impact. Um, so, yeah. Uh is there's no hurdle for this exam correct there's no hurdle um it doesn't make sense to put hurdles on exams that are open book the only point of hurdles has ever been to make sure that um people don't cheat like to use a time when people can't cheat so you basically assess them when they can't cheat and then if they fail that you know they must have cheated for the rest of the course that's the general theory um but for like, but for open book, it makes no sense. So no, it's not, it's not, um, not a hurdle, not at all. And to be honest with you, with the amount of free marks we give out in this course from like labs and we give out a lot of easy marks in this course. Um, when I say easy marks, I don't mean it's like, I don't mean that's like easy to do the work. I mean, like if you do the work, it's really easy to get the mark. Um, between quizzes and labs, I think it's like, 25% immediately, which is a lot. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too stressed for many of you about failing. Um, <clears throat> if the course says that they manually mark things, like the, the problem with manual marking is like, do you, do you have any idea how hard it is to manually mark uh, like a, like a C data structure question? <laughs> Like, 
um, I've taught most courses in C, or most core courses in CSE, and it's like tutoring one five one one. A student's like, my code doesn't work, and you're like, that's why I can see it. I have a brain. Real quick, bam, bam. When it like your tutors and stuff, when when you come to your tutor with like a here's my thirty line Dijkstra algorithm, it's producing the wrong output. Um, even even the really smart tutors, you still look at that and you're like, uh, like it's too much to conceptualize in your head. So for complicated questions, like you know, it's just not feasible. You you could easily spend ten minutes trying to make sense of one person's question. Um, but I, I doubt they would have handmarked everything in one five one one. So anyway, I'm getting to your questions. Everyone's so angsty. Um, is GDB examinable? I'm not sure if that was just helpful advice on the side or actual course content. Uh, I don't know. We're not going to examine that. I don't think it makes sense to examine the use of tools so much. Like, so my, my take on this, and this is also why I'm not that massive about testing testing in this course, is because it's not a core learning outcome of the course. And if you know GDB and you understand how to test, you will get rewarded because you're more likely to get things right. And you're more likely to finish questions sooner. Do you know what I mean? Like, people who know GDB are probably going to have to spend less time debugging. That's their reward. That's my take on it. People who don't know GDB will, will have to spend more time. Um, and I don't judge you. I didn't learn GDB till I had to teach it in my fifth year. So, um, you know, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you that's, that's how I think about it. So, yeah, don't expect questions on GDB. Will there be a loss of marks for Valgrind errors and such? Would it be specified if memory was important? So, these questions came up in the chat earlier too around... Um, will there be like, will there be time limits? Will there be Valgrind things? Um, will there be error inputs? My, my answer to you is like, possibly, and it'll all be written in the question. Like some questions will say, if you, if you leak memory, will, um, you'll lose marks. Some questions will, will say you have to handle this error case. Some questions will, I'm, I know there'll be questions that say that, um, you know, realistically, some questions will also probably give you a time limit. I think just to be clear, in a final exam, the time limits will mainly be focused on trying to weed out terrible solutions, not to not to get good solutions, because it's it is hard to like how to put it like. Going from a bad solution to an, a good solution is really easy to do. Going from a good solution to an extremely optimized solution or, you know, a really thoughtful one like assignment one is really hard. So um, we're not going to be like anything like assignment one where you have to think really deeply about how to make this absolutely super, super, super fast or anything like that. Basically, it'll often just be like your, your answer needs to run within one second. Like, I don't know what we did. I don't think we did this in assignment two, right? I don't think we had... Do we have time constraints? If we did, they were what I'm... There you go. This is this is exactly what I'm talking about. There is no strict efficiency requirement that, but you know, if it takes too long to run, then um, we'll we'll end up terminating it. But but this five seconds here, you got to remember, this isn't because it's hard. It's just because we we need we need to run these tests. Some and it's going to take some time, so we just say that so that we don't spend an hour running someone's code. Um, but don't overthink that part. Trust me. Um, are all the topics in the course examined equally? Um, It's a good question. So, in terms of that, the short answer I'll give you is that most topics in the course will be given equal treatment, though you are very likely to have to deal with a practical question from week nine. Um, that's a near guarantee. That's probably the only thing I'd add. Because we're, we're still writing the exam, so I don't have heart. I mean, I can't tell you anyway, but um, because this was not really able to be assessed and because it was towards the end of the course, 
I'd like to see a practical question on this. It could be a small one, it could be a big one, but the rest of this stuff, like we obviously can't include everything. Um, and a lot of this stuff, when we can't include it uh, practically, we just include it in short answer or something. But I, I'm just telling you now that week nine is probably an area I'd like to include something small, at least practically for that, because I think it's a topic that's neglected. Um, Blake says, can we assume if something like memory or time isn't specified, it won't be checked? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, you know, like when, like there's no surprises here. Like we'll tell you what to do. Um, you know, it's that simple. I think, um, well, Waleed says something that I think is really interesting. It says, we didn't really study tries in any practical depth. You know, so it's like, you know, how do we do this practically if we didn't study it at any practical depth? And it's like, not like not every part of this exam is guaranteed to be free money, right? Like, we've talked about tries. Conceptually, you get them, for instance. Um, we've given you, like, pseudocode for it, and we've talked about, like, C-style structures. Where is it? C-style structure you use to implement it. It wouldn't... It would be, honestly, very reasonable to, like to give you a like a, a, a structure and say something like write an insert function like the tools are at your disposal like it's not it's not like it's not like it's dead easy you know but it's uh it does it doesn't make me question if I, it's if it's educationally ethical right so yeah there are going to be some things that are feel like spoon feeding because we want to have some easy marks there are going to be some things where you're going to have to combine concepts there are going to be some things where you're going to have to um you know Un unabstract things and make them concrete. Um, Blake says the hashing content was more about the structure and didn't really cover making good hash functions. So a hash question is going to be about the actual structure. Um, well, I mean, a hash a hash question would like it's hard to answer. Um, we we could ask you to to build a little hash table with a hash function given. We could ask you to take a hash table that exists and convert it to a, a separate chaining thing. Um, I, I think something I want to really stress to you all is like, you know, Kevin and I are going to look after the exam, but I'm not going to ask you questions that I don't know how to answer. And I don't do this stuff for a living. Like, I've never written a try before. I've never written a, a hash table before. Well, I think I did in an interview once, like, seven years ago. But it's like... Um, it's, you know, that, that I, I, I guarantee you there'll be a, a very level-headed degree of common sense when it comes to what we can expect that you know or that you should be able to synthesize together without it making any massive conceptual leaps of understanding um, for the majority of students. <clears throat> Anytime I say anything, it's always for the majority of students, right? Like when I say like, you know, we want this to be an exam you can finish. I'm not talking to you personally. I don't know you. I don't know how capable you are or how anxious you get in exams and stuff. Like, I'm just, when I say you, I'm talking about most people. Um, so, you know, don't, don't be sitting there being like, damn it, Hayden promised me something. I'm like, I, I guess. Um, will there be memes in the question sheet? Maybe. That'd be fun. Um, can we have practice questions for week nine topics like a unmarked mini lap lab, I guess, uh, where we can get some practice coding it with some kind of auto test? Um, yeah, I'd like that. That's how I'd start with that answer. Um, I'd like to give you practice on everything. We will do our best, though. It's just there's only so much time and resources, right? Um, it's the, the only thing I'd say is like a lot of this stuff, like you, you really have to believe in yourselves sometimes, honestly. Like, if you said, like, if I was practicing for this exam right now, and, and again, I haven't, I, I've been mainly thinking about the short answer stuff, so I haven't looked at the programming stuff at all. So I'm telling you right now, like, uh, this is not priming you. I might accidentally prime myself by talking about this, but it's not the other way around. It's like, if I said I'm going to implement a hash table, like, uh, it's right, I, I, have some, I have some structures, I can just go and try and do it. 
I can test if it works just by using it. You know, like a like a, a, a lab question on it's not going to like yes, that would be helpful, but like the lack of that does not inhibit your ability to, to learn. Um, you know, and, and I just want to be clear, the the exam will assume that you understand stuff we've taught. Right? Like, because think about, think about just the hash table thing again for an example. If we asked you to build a hash table, you have to understand what a hashing function is. You have to potentially understand what a linked list is or an array. If you know those things, then even if the question is new to you, you should be able to solve it, right? Like, this is not a rote learning exam. It's like, they, these are problem solving stuff. So, don't, don't feel like there's this whole um, unknown mass of things that you might get asked to do that you don't perfect right now because... Like, there's no exam like that, right? Like, I mean, no good exam, I guess I should say. Um, we want to make sure you understand all the fundamentals so that what you're, what you're given, you're like, ah, I've never done that before, but I see a path. I see a path. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so short answer is we'll do our best. But it's like, in the absence of getting everything we want to give you, it's like, you're, you're still fine. You're not inhibited. Um, Question from Kustab. Um, this isn't really to the exam, but I noticed a lot of content is cut compared to past terms, whether it's due to trimesters or other. A lot of other courses do this too. Um, would it be possible for us to get the old lecture material for those topics so that we can go through those ourselves in our own time? Feels weird to learn less because you took the course after 2019 instead of before. Sure. Um, I'll try and dig up some of the older stuff. Um, to be clear, the stuff that was cut out by me this term was often a lot of a little bit. Um, like, so here is, I hope I have access to my own Google Sheet. Here is, uh, I can share this around with people, like it's fine. These are Ashesh's lectures, or maybe, I don't even know if Ashesh wrote them. But these are the ones Ashesh used at least. Um, and this is what I based most of my stuff off. So, like, this is, like, the graph representation stuff. Um, most things that have been cut this term by me have been, s like, little, little niggly bits on the side. So, I can at least share these. Like, a good example is in analysis of algorithms. Um, I think there was a whole bunch of stuff. This was a long deck. There was a bunch of stuff at the end, like, talking about um, theta and omega time and... Um, I just kind of looked at all this stuff and was like, some, some, not all, you know, just a little bit of it I'd look at and think, I don't think this helps. Like, I don't think this helps achieve the goal we're trying to achieve right now. I'm not saying I'm right, it could be wrong, but I don't think there's much that's been cut out this term of any meaning, um, <clears throat> in my view, naturally. Um, the only big things we cut out were we cut out, we cut out red black trees. We cut out shell sort. And a couple other things. Can't remember. Anyway, very little, but I'll, I'll, I'll look into that for you. Um, I'll look, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Sounds good. Um, okay, let me just finish this. Then we'll take a break and we can see if there's any other lingering questions. Um, probably just the last one. The only real, the only two things here. Um, oh yeah, we cut out function pointers too, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but that was only ever in for an, anyway. It's fine. That wasn't that wasn't really cut. That was unnecessarily added. Anyway, during the exam. Any communication you have that isn't like of a personal, special consideration thing you post on the forum about. So we'll make all the posts on the forum private by default. So that's where you go to post. Um, and yeah, don't email me for stuff. Happens every time a student emails me and they're like, I can't log into VLab. It's like, post on the forum for pretty much everything. The only reason you should be emailing me is if you, you're stopping the exam because I want a paper trail of it. You know, like it's official. It's really official. Um, so you're always posting on the ed forum um, for during the exam. 
what's important to note is that when you post on the ed forum, we need you to post clearly. We need to, you to make sense. We need you to share screenshots. Because what happens during the exam is that you got to think of it like we answer questions as part of a queue. So if there are 10 people who post answers or questions and we answer the first one and the second one and the third one, we don't know what they're asking and we say to you, what do you mean? We're going to go to the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh one until we get back to you. Do you know what I mean? Like every time someone does something, it falls into a theoretical queue. So it's really important that when you have a problem, you know, tell us if you're using VS Code, tell us, you know, what went wrong. Tell us, like, send us a screenshot of it. Um, but, you know, like a good forum post. I tell you that because it, it not only makes our lives easier, but it it literally gets you answers quicker. Um, Blake says, how is this queue implemented? Via email. <laughs> um, I just get emails and I, I they're sorted by date. So I just open them in a date order. That's it. Um, so that's, that's during the exam. You post on the forum. Um, we can't answer questions for you. Like, why does my code not compile? Or why am I getting a seg fault? The nature of the exam is that that's on you. Um, I know that many of you are starting to get quite young now in terms of your kind of a post-pandemic team of people who didn't really do closed book exams much at the uni. But in, in a closed book exam, if you were to ask someone, you know, hey, my code doesn't compile, do you know why? They'd literally laugh at you and then walk away probably. Not really. But they'd, they'd like literally just be like, <laughs> no, I can't help you with that. Like, good luck. And the same kind of things online. It's easy to forget that because it doesn't feel like an exam sometimes. It feels like a, a, a time short assignment. But, um, you know, that's the, that's the reality of what we're working with. The only other comment to make here is that while this is an open book exam and you are able to use the internet and everything, you can't um, get help from other students during the exam. Basically, the way I tell people is you have to assume that the world is your oyster. You can do what you want, Google what you want, look up what you want, but everyone is dead. Everyone except you for this exam. You're the only person left on the planet. That's how you have to operate. You can, you can leave, you can go, you can go down and you know, go to the park and jump in the pool. You can look on Stack Overflow. You can read through the lecture slides. You can play music. Um, you can pat your dog. But, like, no humans should exist to you as a general rule. Now, obviously, there are some common sense things here, right? Like, you know, if, if your parent comes into the room and says, how are you doing? You can't be like, you don't exist to me. Goodbye. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. It's just like, you know, use some common sense here. Um, it's just like, don't talk to your friends. Don't, don't post on Stack Overflow. Don't use Messenger. Um, don't use whatever. And like, again, two things you want to understand. I'm giving you a very general rule here so you're not confused, but it's like, if I, if I was doing an exam, you know, like one of, one of my closest friends is a, is a 37-year-old accountant, basically. Um, and if he texts me a funny meme, I'm going to react to it during the exam because it makes me laugh. Um, but, you know, it's like, that's because you're just, that's just a benign interaction. The Probably the simplest thing I'd say is that don't talk to anyone who is either helping you with the exam and don't talk to anyone who um, is a student in CSE or has been a student in CSE. <clears throat> um... Are we allowed to talk to people afterwards in regards to the exam? I think I've taken this part out. I should add it back in, but... Um, uh, <laughs> Of course, you can talk to someone about the exam, after the exam, who sat the exam with you. But if you talk to anyone who's yet to sit the exam, or you post publicly, Discord, Facebook, Ed, whatever, information about the exam, then that would be considered academic misconduct. Right? 
you don't you only talk about the exam privately and only with people who you know have finished the exam that's that's the that's the simple ones there as well um Waleed says, can we copy small bits of code from existing Stack Overflow posts? It's so hard for me to answer that because it depends on the code. All I'd say is like, if you copy any substantial amount of code that isn't like a few lines, it's very likely that our plagiarism detection will pick up on it. Um, so you can post on the forum during the exam and ask is what I'd maybe say, get a yes or no from us. Um, last thing, just on the topic of cheating. There's this thing here about communicating during the exam. Last time I ran an open book exam, I, 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 I think I failed like 10 students um, because they cheated. We will find you. I, I just, I, I can't stress this enough. I say it every term and people keep doing it. Like, don't copy other people's stuff. You, you really, every student, every student underestimates the, the quality of plagiarism detecting tools, particularly between students. Like, it's really hard. If you, if you get your, if you pay your cousin $500 to do the exam, it's really hard for us to f figure that out. Like, I'm not going to lie about it. And if you really want to waste money on the course and on your cousin just so that you can come out not very smart, it's like that's that's a life choice I guess you can make that doesn't make any sense to me. But it's like at a very don't share with each other at the very minimum. I'm, I'm not even pleading to your ethics here. I'm just pleading to your self interest. It's like we will find you, and we will like fail you potentially. Um, at the very least, you'll get zero for the exam. And uh, trust me, people who are getting full marks in the other sections aren't the ones copying. So you will fail the course by um, as a, as a downstream effect of that. Um, can we plagiarize our own code from previous labs? Yes, I'm fine with that. I don't really understand self plagiarism too well. Um, so I'm fine with it. Uh, are we still able to use lecture slides? Yes. You, it, we're not going to take web CMS three down. You can watch my lecture. Don't watch my lectures during the exam, but like you could, if you wanted to, it's all going to be there. Um, a sample solutions to labs taken off. No, like it's just, it's just there. Like it's just left there. It's just an open book exam. That's it. Just new questions. World's your oyster. Just no one's around. Last comment I want to make. Um, preparation. So... Labs, tutorials, assignments, quizzes are great ways to prepare for the exam. I understand people still like sample stuff. So we will provide it. Um, I was hoping to get that out to you today. But life's been really cooked lately. So I've had to prioritize some other things first. Um, it's on my to-do list to get done in the next couple of days. I'm going to try and get it done by Thursday. But if I don't... Um, it'll be like out this weekend or something. Um, like I know that's like not great, but I kind of was probably a bit over ambitious how early I got that out because we're kind of going to have to recatalog stuff. So I'll do my best, but worst case is we get it to you like a week and a half before the final exam, which I think is still fine. But um, yeah, so thanks for your patience on that. It'll come out. You've got plenty to do in the meantime. It's not like anyone here is going to be like, I can't do anything because I don't have the sample exam and assignment two's not even due yet. Like, it's, I know that's not reality, so I'm not worried. I'm just formally letting you know that I'm doing my best on that front. So we'll get that, um, we'll get that sorted. Uh, you can use any code from the course. You can take from lecture slides, from labs, from your stuff. Like, it's the, that's all fine. It'd be weird to ask you not to do that. At least in my opinion which apparently is all that matters when you're on courses, which is kind of weird, but um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's been it's cooked for everyone these days. I'm aware of that. I'm not looking for a pity party. Everyone's just, uh, I've had to prioritize a few other things I can't talk about uh, openly, but um, it's like, that's pretty much it. So what I guess I want to know is like, 
Because on Thursday, like my hope on Thursday is that we can talk through some sample exams. I'm probably going to prioritize this course before C++, the other course I teach, because um, uh, you guys have your exams sooner and also like there's actually less work to do because we actually have past papers for this course. We just have to collate them properly. Um, so I, I might, the aim is on Thursday to kind of chat again and talk about the sample exam and answer some more questions you have. The thing I want to ask though is, does anyone have more questions today about the exam? Because there's no point taking a 10 minute break just to, just to like come back and talk for 10 minutes. Like we might as well chat for 10 minutes now. So maybe I'll just ask you like, if you have any lingering questions, can you ask them now? And let's see what we have to go through. And if you don't really have that many to ask, we'll just wrap up after I answer a couple. So yeah, what, what other questions do people have about the exam for now? You can ask later, you can ask on the forum, that's all fine. Oh, shit. How hard is it going to be? Um, <laughs> like, like, it's going to feel hard. It's an exam. Assignments feel hard. It's not going to crush your soul. Assuming you have a self-awareness about your own intellect. Um, oh, sorry. Right, you were joking. <laughs> um, one last question. Are we aiming to get assignment two marks back before your exam? Yes, I, I hope. God. Um, we get your, your assignment two marks are submitted on Friday. We then have two days of late penalties, and then we have to run the auto marking, which gives your tutors a week to do it. I don't know. I doubt it, to be honest with you. Because um, your tutors are also studying. And last time we gave them a week and a half to two weeks. Um, it's funny you guys say this because with the other course I teach, C++, I've told the students that uh, we, we made their assignment due in week 10 on the Monday and the reason we do that is so they can actually get like marks before the exam. So I think there's a little bit of a trade-off where um, uh, you can kind of pick between getting an extra four days in week 10 for an assignment or you can get your marks back. I might actually make a poll about that and I might actually make a poll about that because I actually think that's an interesting question because I have anecdotal evidence about that but um, I'd be interested to see which way people lean as to whether they'd rather like this is you know with plenty of notice you know would they rather the extra four days or would they rather get their marks back because um, I have I have an answer but that's just based on the feedback of 20 people not hundreds um, Funny questions. Uh, Dior says, if we submit at 12 on the dot and give doesn't accept, what do we do? Oh, here's the endless conundrum. Um, oh, yeah, we could release the auto mark results. That's fair, Chewy. We'll probably do that. I'm sure we'll do that. Thank you for reminding me. I mean, that probably would have come up anyway. I just wasn't thinking. Um, what if you submit at 12? Now, here's the thing. Um, when, we, when we make exams due... It's the actual final give cutoff is going to be like 12.03 or something. 12.02, 12.04. Um, if you submit at 12, 12.01, 12 and 30 seconds, you'll get it in fine. Um, but once you miss that hard cutoff of like 12.02 or something, and we're not telling you what it is because we've told you the cutoff's 12, right? Because if I tell you the actual cutoff's 12.03, you're just like, I'll just submit it by then. And then you'll, then you'll submit it at 12.03 and then I'll just get an email from you being like, but I submitted it so close to the deadline. And it's like, no, you didn't. You submitted it three minutes late from the deadline. Um, so my point is there's, there's, a, there's, there's a reasonable common sense leeway we give you of, let's call it a minute and a half just because you're going to want a number anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to call it a minute and a half and don't stress about that square on 12 thing because the thing about students is that I know what it's like sitting exams, all you do as well. No one in their right mind is trying to solve a problem at 12. You're all trying to submit frantically. The reason you haven't submitted at 12 is because you either struggle to use a computer or you, you're too anxious to work the keyboard or you've 
dropped your water on your lap or like something's happened right like you're not working at 12 because you'd be an absolute lunatic to try and keep working when you know it's due so there's there's a very small amount of leeway there again there's so much of what we do is modeled on the idea that like you know we're just trying to approach this with common sense but anyway um I woke up at 12 <laughs> please don't be the person that doesn't submit and then has a nap till midnight just don't do that please um thank you anyway let's um let's wrap it up i feel like the questions are coming to an end and there's no point taking a break so let's chat on thursday we'll talk a little bit about the sample exam which i'm pretty sure we'll get something up by then i'll i'll, I'll figure it out um and um yeah we can answer some other questions but other than that like good luck with assignment two for those still working on it and um can you play us a song to end the lecture you know the piano no no sadly not um i'll i'll show you my if you if i'll show you some stuff in my room on thursday ask your question matthew i'll show you some stuff on my room on thursday after i clean it is i don't know if you can i don't know if you can tell but um maybe i can show you my new webcam it's probably So weird. Um, anyway, really quickly, this is my uh, really quickly. This is my new webcam. Let me cut the cropping off. It's way too wide angle. It's like I have to crop it down so I don't look weird. But that's the new webcam. So, um, so yeah. I'll tell you about a couple things, like the giraffe up there. You've probably never seen that because the camera's cut it off. But there's a giraffe that's always pointing to four o'clock or whatever time that is. Um, Matthew Johnston still haven't asked your question. Oh, you had a question that I missed, had you? Is that why you pointed up? I'm sorry if I've missed your question. You can post on the forum, though, or ask it on Thursday. Um, the draft is not a clock. <laughs> Funnily enough, the draft is not a clock. Um, I'm, I'm sure I missed a couple. You guys had a lot of questions. Oh, will we be able to run the simple check things locally? Uh, mm, probably not. It's just too hard to, to get reliable. There'll, there'll be the assumption that you're submitting via CSE, and that's where the check... This checks will happen when you try to submit. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Um, distrust from South Africa. Um, my my partner at the time was in South Af from South Africa, and and she brought back a a draft that was made in a street market or something. It's made of steel. It's kind of cute. Um, but yeah, if you make draft, if anyone makes a draft clock, I'll buy it if it's less than thirty dollars. Good luck. But uh, let's let's uh, I don't I, I get weird when we talk about me for too long. So let's wrap it up. Um, thank you everyone and ask about the koala on Thursday. But I'll leave you all to it. Let's chat Thursday, and we'll try and get that sample exam out to you by then. And keep going. So have a good day, everyone.